But today we're gonna create an R package to actually implement the geohash algorithm using the geohash crate. I'm also gonna take this as an opportunity for us to kind of dive into some of the more advanced topics with the extender library. We're gonna use the use this create package function to create a package for us. I've now created a package called geohash. Now that we've opened up this new package, let's go ahead and instantiate extender. Now we have to be careful here. We have to ensure that the library name and the crate name are actually different than the package name because we're gonna be creating a package called geohash and we're gonna be importing a crate called geohash. So we wanna make sure there's no name conflicts. So we'll call this crate name equals r geohash lib name equals r geohash. So this has created the scaffolding that we need and now let's go into the terminal. Let's cd into source and rust. From here, I can open up VS Code. Let's go ahead and add our dependency. Let's go ahead and open up our lib.rs file. We don't need the hello world function. Go ahead and delete that. Let's create a new function called encode. It's gonna take two arguments, X and Y, and they're both gonna be F64s. And then the result is gonna be a single string. In the body of our function, we'll use the geohash encode function. This is gonna be expecting a coordinate and a length. So that's something I actually forgot. Let's go ahead in here and say length. Let's have this as an I32 because in R, there is no such thing as a U size. Then inside of here, let's say let length equals length as U size. So we're casting this I32 as a U size val value. Then we'll put length here, but we still need to be able to create a coordinate. So we're gonna go up here and add that chord type. So we'll say use geohash chord now we can say let c equals chord and now we have a coordinate now let's take this um result of the encode and say let encoded equal for this step right now we're just going to unwrap this and return the string as is and always expect we have good inputs but that's not always going to be the case so now let's run our cargo check and we see that we have an unused function so first let's add the extender attribute macro and we say function encode Perfect. Now, if we hop back over into our studio, we can build this up and use it. So here, let's run the build command. So the shortcut is command shift B. Then once this is done, we'll run our extender, extender document. Okay, so now this has been documented. Let's go ahead and see if it worked. End code available to us. And let's say um, 34 and negative 120. Length is missing, that is anticipated, and now let's say six. We have an error. Invalid coordinate range, x34, y120. Ah, y only ranges from negative 90 to 90. So let's say 57. There we go, that looks awesome. So now what we wanna do is actually be able to iterate through many values of this. So let's go back to VS Code. The way we've written this function right now only works with scalar inputs. So for now, let's change our X and Y's to be doubles. And then let's just comment this all out for the time being so we have something that we can work with a little bit better. And since we're vectorizing this and we're iterating over doubles and our Y, the output is not gonna be a single string, but instead a character vector. So the type here is strings. I've emptied out the entire body of the encode function so we can start fresh. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an iterator from X and also an iterator from Y, but we're also gonna zip them together so we can iterate through them together. So we'll say x dot into iter dot zip y into into iter. Now what we can do with this is we can map through elements from both of these at the same time. So we'll map through yi and xi. And for the time being, I'm gonna put to do at the bottom. So the return type is just kind of automatically handled. And then we're gonna say if xi is na or yi is na, we're gonna return a missing value. So we'll say R S T R N A. This is the scalar equivalent of a character value. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but um, while we're working with strings, this is the individual element. So now we'll say else. Now, if that's the case, we're gonna extract the inner F64 value. So that X I equals, and then that Y I equals, so from an R float, we can extract the inner F64 value by using this inner method. And this is a risky thing to do because what if there are NAs, but we've checked for them already. So I feel comfortable doing this. So now we need to create our coordinate from this value. 
So we'll say let C equals chord. Perfect. Now we'll use the geohash encode function on that coordinate and the length as Q size. Okay, so now we have this encoded string, but it may or may not actually be a valid geohash string. So what we can do here is we can match this. So say match encoded. If this was an okay result, then we're gonna capture this hash and then create an RSTR from it. Otherwise we'll return just a missing value. Now from this, we can collect the results into a character vector. Now we got a bunch of red here, so let's see what we're missing. Ah, missing an S at strings. Oh, we wanna use XI and YI, not X. X colon, Y colon. Okay, so now that compiles. So let's hop back into our studio and build this and see how it works. Let's run our center document to catch the new changes to the function. We're gonna create some random X and Y values. So let's do our unif and let's do 100. So the minimum value of a longitude can be negative 180 and the maximum can be 180. Then for Y, let's do a similar thing, 100 values. And then minimum for uh, latitude is negative 90 and the maximum is 90. So now we'll do encode X, Y, and then let's just do five. Awesome, let's go up to 10. Okay, now the maximum value should be, I think 12 or 15 or 13. It's 12, okay. So what we can see is that we're actually getting NA values here. So our match statement actually worked for us, which is really exciting. So we're already able to handle NA values, I think. So let's see what happens if we try to encode um, NA values in X or Y. We get NA there, that's perfect. So now I'm feeling pretty confident in this encoding function. Now let's go back here and look at decoding a little bit more. So this decode function, it takes one of these input strings and then we decode the results into a coordinate as well as its longitude error and its latitude error. Well, I know out of the box that this right here isn't gonna really work for extender. This doesn't, not a struct that we really know how to work with. But for the time being, let's just create a simple decode function and print the results that we would have gotten from Rust. And then we can think through how we might actually return the results back to R. So inside of VS Code, let's create a function called decode. It's gonna take one parameter, it'll be called geohash. And for the time being, we'll take a string slice as a result and we're gonna return nothing from it. We're just gonna to try to print the results. So geohash, colon, colon, decode. And then we'll take the geohash here. And so here we're using the rprintline macro to print the results from this function. Now we need to put the extender attribute macro on top of this and also create the function decode. Now we'll load all and let's see if we have a decode function available. Okay, geohash is missing. So let's just copy one of these geohashes and see what we get. Okay, cool. So we see that we have this coordinate with the fields X and Y and two other float values. So maybe what we'd actually like is a data frame that looks kind of like this, right? X, Y, X error, Y error. So let's, let's think about how we can actually make this happen inside of extender. What we know is that this decode function returns a result with a coordinate with two fields, X and Y, and then two more float values. So let's actually try to create our own struct that we can use to return to R. Now I'm just pasting this here for reference for myself. So let's create a struct decode decoded. And it's gonna have four fields, right? We're gonna have X, which is gonna take an F64, Y, which is an F64, and then another, which is an X error, F64, and then Y error, F64. Now, we also might encounter incorrect decodings. So in this case, they might not always be an F64. We might need to be able to say, well, this thing didn't work. So we'll use an option in that case, because an option is kind of like an NA value in Rust where it can either be this value or it cannot be this value. So it's either gonna get a value of none or some. So we're gonna wrap everything in here inside of these options. Because if we get an error, we wanna return none. But we still always wanna return this struct. 
Okay, so now we've defined this struct called decoded, but we need to make it such that R can really work with it or extender can work with it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this derive macro. It's gonna implement some traits for us on our behalf. I'm gonna first derive the debug trait, which will kind of allow me to use a printing method. And then we'll also have clone so we can clone it. And then there's this special one called into data frame row. This is going to allow us to return the results back to R as a data frame. It's pretty nifty. Let's just check that we can compile this. And that looks great. Let's go back to our decode function here and let's call this let decoded raw equals this and what we'll see is we have this result if we have a valid value inside of this we're going to want to return this decoded thing with a sum value but if it's not we're going to return a none value or kind of like an na equivalent so again let's do that match and we'll do decoded raw All right, so if it's okay i'll call it d and then with d i want to be able to take this coordinate and then extract the x and y and now I'll say let x, y equals. So this is called destructuring. If it's a tuple, I can extract the elements of the tuple individually by kind of creating a tuple on the left-hand side of the assignment. With this, I can actually create the struct. So I'll say decoded. So with decoded, now I'm gonna say x colon sum x, y colon sum y, and then here we'll say x error colon sum, and then we'll extract the values directly from d which is here, that's the correct index. And then y error colon d2. Okay, so now what we're seeing is that we have mismatched arms. They expected unit or nothing and then found decoded, which makes sense because we're not actually returning anything here. So for the time being, I'm gonna say let decoded equal this and store that there. Now once you get another error, we're saying we haven't actually covered the error case. So we've covered the case where we have a result, but not the case where we don't have a result. So now here I'm gonna say error. How are we actually gonna handle the error? Well, there's another trait that we can actually use called default, which is a default value for a struct at any point. And here, if you have an option, the default value is gonna be none. So that can kind of be our NA equivalent. So here I'll just say, we're not gonna actually have any value in error. And then we're gonna say decoded colon colon default. And now that's gonna return a default version of that struct. And since we fixed our error, we can see that the inlay hint is shown up here. There's another nifty thing that we can do with this because we've derived it into data frame row trait. I can create a vector of these structs and then use into data frame. And this is gonna change the return type. So if we run the compiler check, we see some errors here. So it expected nothing, but we have a result. So um, I know this is always gonna work because I've handled the okay and error situation. So I'm gonna unwrap it. I know that there's a current limitation of extender that we're working through that you can't return one of these data frame objects from a function. But what we can do is we can turn this into an R object and clone it so we get an, um, an owned R object and we can return this from the function. And I know if you see this, you see clone and you're worried. Well, you really shouldn't be because all we're doing is incrementing a reference count. So we're not actually doing any sort of memory copying or anything. We're just incrementing how many things are referring to this object. So now if we check our compiler, we have an error again because I forgot to return let res equal to R obj. Okay. Now let's go back into our studio and see how this actually looks. So let's build our package. So if we decode this, we have a data frame with a single row, which is awesome. And let's put in some just totally gobbledygook here. Now we have missing values. So we know that we can handle the case where we have bad values and we have good values. So now let's think about how we actually iterate through this. Now that we've done all of this, it was kind of a lot of work just inside of the body of one function. But what we can actually do is simplify this a lot. We converted this tuple of chord F64 and F64 into this decoded struct. Well, we can implement a trait called from that will allow us to cast directly from this structure into our decoded structure. So we'll say impl from, and then this is the type that we're gonna be implementing from, and then for, or implementing to, so it's just decoded. 
And then we're gonna implement our missing members. This is just gonna say to do for now. And this is a cord, F64 and F64. So now what we can do is we can take the values like this and check that that compiled correctly. Okay, so we can copy and paste that and then now we'll modify it to say value .x, and then we can just say value .0.y and then this could be, I think, value dot one and this is value dot two perfect so now we can see that we've actually um, implemented this trait and let's try going up into here and seeing if we can use the trait right away decoded from d let d equal and this is really neat right so we've deleted all of that code and got this which is so nice and we can we can use this in an iterator instead so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna gut everything in here and change this input into strings. And now we can iterate through our geohash into iter.map ghi for geohash i. That's gonna be an rstr. And so what I'll do is cast that as a string. And then we'll use the decode, um, geohash decode function here. Let decode raw equal this. Okay. Well, I clearly have a typo here, so decode. So now we have a result and we'll match on our result again, decode raw, and then we'll say, okay, D, then decoded from D. And in the case that we have an error, we're gonna use the default again, right? So default colon colon. All right, so at this point, what we wanna do is now we're gonna collect this into a vector of decoded structs. And we'll call this let all decoded, and then because we have a vector of this type that has the into data frame row checked, we can say all decoded into data frame. And then we can do the same thing again, unwrap as our object and clone. Now this compiles all nicely. However, we didn't handle the situation where we have a missing value. So let's go in here and handle that. So if GHI is NA decoded default else, We'll put this inside of there. Now we've handled the case where this is going to be a, a missing value. And we've also handled the case where the geohash is invalid and we'll have returned a data frame of all these values. So let's go back into our studio and build this up. Okay. So let's encode a bunch of different geohashes. Let's call this geohashes. And then let's go ahead and try decoding our geohashes. Look at this. Now we have a hundred row data frame right out of the bat, no other cleaning had to happen. And that was so, so fast. I mean, that's so exciting. Now let's see if this handles missing values very well. I'm gonna just take the first 10 values here, geo hashes. Okay, so we have 10 values here. Now let's say geo hashes, I don't know, two through three are gonna be NA values. And we'll say geo hashes 10, is gonna be something that's just totally not gonna to work. We run this function and we see lines two through three have uh, NAs for rows, then line 10 has NA for rows as well. So we've been able to encode and decode these things into structures that are gonna work really well for us in R. And that's this is the idea behind Extender, is we can use these high-powered Rust libraries and we can use R all together to make really performant code that feels really nice. Now there's a lot more that we can do here, like type checking. In a follow-up video, I think it might be worth going through decode box to illustrate how we might be able to, you know, return an actually an SF object. In this case, we can take a geohash and then return a bounding box from that. So here maybe we'll create an SF object in the future or we'll identify the neighbors, so on and so forth. But I think what we've gone through today is a really good start for creating a really powerful R package. I hope that you learned something about R or Rust or both of them and you're excited to go ahead and build something new all by yourself. If you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments or hit me up on Twitter.